Chapter 10 The $40 Million Slave The Dilemma of Wealth Without Control Niggas are players, niggas are players, are players. Niggas play football, basketball, and baseball while the white man is cutting off their balls. The Last Poets, circa 1969, from the album Niggas Are Scared of Revolution. Kurt Flood was the first person I ever heard use a plantation metaphor in connection with professional athletes. I'm sure someone else had used the metaphor before him, but the first time the comparison really resonated in my soul was when Flood invoked the comparison in 1969. At the time, he was probably the best center fielder in baseball. He was a three-time All-Star and a seven-time Gold Glove winner with a career batting average of 293. Flood's brilliance went beyond numbers. He had the effortless gliding speed that I first saw in Willie Mays. By 1969, Flood in most minds had replaced Mays as the greatest center fielder in baseball. Flood, like Mays, wasn't just great. He was cool and great. I had no idea just how cool Flood really was. In the winter of 1969, he was traded from the St. Louis Cardinals, where he had played since 1958, to Philadelphia. Flood was stunned. A trade was the furthest thing from his mind. Flood had hit 285, knocked in 57 runs, and generally had another sound season. But Jim Tooney, the Cardinals' vice president, told Flood that he had been traded. Despite his time and stature in the game, Flood had not been given the courtesy of a call or warning beforehand. Nothing. He was traded. That's how business was done. Athletes of his generation were powerless to determine their fate. They had limited options. Flood, who was making $92,000 at the time, exercised his option in the extreme. He refused to go to Philadelphia. In one of the most significant communications in sports labor history, Flood wrote to then baseball commissioner Bowie Kuhn that, quote, after 12 years in the major leagues, I do not feel that I am a piece of property to be bought and sold irrespective of my wishes, end quote. But that's exactly what he was. In fact, that's what all athletes were. So many pieces of property to be bought, sold, or discarded as their, quote unquote, owners saw fit. This was, and still is, allowable in sports because athletes are supposed to be grateful for the opportunity. This mode of treatment was legitimized by the reserve clause in Major League Baseball. The reserve clause allowed teams to hold on to players as long as they wanted, but forbade the players from testing the market on their terms, and quote-unquote iron fist that Flood compared to sharecropping. The reserve system was the same system used in the South where the plantation owner owned all the houses that you live in, Flood said, and you worked for him and you shopped in his store and you never got over the hump. In Flood's mind, a divide between players and owners was ingrained in their roles. They're the ranchers and we're the cattle. The owners were given license to do this by the federal government. The reserve clause prevented players from moving to another team unless they were traded or sold. Flood challenged the fairness of a system that kept players in perpetual servitude to their teams at the owner's pleasure. Flood's dramatic action took place in the middle of my sophomore year in college. I was just beginning to become aware of the brutal business side of sports, of how athletes were economic creatures in a peculiar entertainment industry. The sports industry ran on the fuel of strong bodies, black or white, from small colleges or large, and an overdeveloped sense of gratitude. Athletes generally were just happy to be there, whether they were on scholarship or under contract. But by 1969, the tide had been shifting, giving way to a more aggressive sense of self-worth on the part of black athletes. In 1967, Muhammad Ali was stripped of his heavyweight boxing championship for refusing to be drafted for religious reasons. In 1968, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, then known as Lou Alcindor, refused to join the United States Olympic basketball team. 
And of course, at the 1968 Mexico City Games, Tommy Smith and John Carlos staged their historic protest. Flood filed his suit in 1970. During a meeting with the union's executive board in December 1969, Tom Haller, a white player, asked Flood if his action, then pending, was his response to baseball's history of racial discrimination. Flood said that he believed he had suffered harder times than white players. The change in black consciousness in recent years had made him, quote, more sensitive to injustice in every area of my life, end quote. There was so much social turbulence in the United States that political and social neutrality wasn't really an option, particularly for black athletes who were aware of the recent controversy as well as the larger dramas of the civil rights movement. What made Flood's fight resonate is that at one level his battle went beyond race. Flood said he was filing this suit against a quote-unquote situation that was improper for all ball players. Many white players never thought of themselves as being on a plantation or as being only so much chattel. But the legacy of black people in sports had sensitized Flood that history had tuned him into a different frequency than white players had access to. He used the insight born of that legacy to help all players, black and white, fight a corrupt system. The executive board of the Players Association liked what it heard and voted unanimously to support Flood. But Flood had committed the cardinal sin. He challenged baseball bosses and they went on to destroy him as a player with the help of other players and the sports media. Marvin Miller, the attorney for the Players Union, warned Flood from the start of his battle with Major League Baseball that if he went forward with the suit, his life in baseball was over. He would not be elected to the Hall of Fame. He would never manage or be given any significant management position in baseball. Undaunted, Flood pressed on. He decided to sit out the 1970 season. Rather than report to Philadelphia and accept the $100,000 salary the Phillies offered, Sitting out was the ultimate sacrifice for a veteran player with limited seasons left to play and desperately needing to play to keep his skills sharpened. But Flood was committed to the fight. What makes one man stand on principle and others sit quietly by and accept what is being handed out? Most of Flood's peers were terrified. Fast and courageous on the field, star players of the day, like star players today, were terrified of taking on their owners. Maury Wills, the daring base runner who set a base stealing record in 1962 admitted, quote, most of us were not courageous enough to take that stand and challenge the owners. I know I wasn't, but some were. Flood's friend and teammate, Bob Gibson, came to Flood's trial. Jackie Robinson testified on Flood's behalf. In his autobiography, The Way It Is, Flood said that one of the most moving moments of the trial occurred when Robinson walked into the courthouse on the day he was scheduled to testify. Quote, as he and Rachel Robinson moved into the courtroom, you could hear a pin drop because he had a real presence about him. Robinson sat close to Flood, Flood later recalled. Then he looked at me, I said, I really appreciate your taking the time and effort to do this. And he said, well... You can't be out there by yourself. I remember these words very well. You can't be out there by yourself, and I would be remiss if I didn't share these burdens with you. Robinson understood history. He was history, and he understood the continuity of struggle, both the black struggle and the struggle for human freedom, which in Robinson's mind were intertwined. A year earlier, Robinson had supported John Carlos and Tommy Smith in their protest at the 1968 Summer Olympic Games in Mexico City. Once, while explaining why he had reluctantly supported Nixon over John F. Kennedy, Robinson explained that he had not felt Kennedy was committed to the black cause and thus the cause of humanity. He said, quote, I am most interested in a candidate who I think will be best for the black American because I am convinced that the black struggle and its solution are fundamental to the struggle to make America what it is supposed to be." End quote. Robinson had long since stopped repaying baseball with quote, glad tidings. 
no matter what the sporting news demanded. While Kurt Flood told the Major League Baseball executive board that his challenge was not coming out of the race bag of the 60s, he also knew that he could not separate himself from the political and racial climate of the day. The 60s is an era that will never be forgotten. Being a child of those years between 1959 and 1969, America was coming apart at the seams and our boys were in Southeast Asia giving their lives. We were marching all over Berkeley. We lost Dr. King. We lost the Kennedys. We lost Medgar Evers. And true ugliness was happening to us as a people in the 60s. Little children were being shut out of education. And the mood of the 60s was dark and somber. And merely because you're a professional athlete does not defend you from that. Flood said that the currents of world affairs had an impact on him as an athlete and baseball player because... All of the things that we were fighting for all over the world, we weren't getting in my profession. And from the time someone made me stay in the colored section while the white kids stayed on the beach in the white high-rise hotel, I felt like a nigger. Whatever that means. Those years between 1960 and 1969 really were growing years for me. With the Union Executive Board's support, Flood's case reached the Supreme Court two years later in 1972. He lost his case that year in large part because no active players showed support. Not only did Flood lose the case, he lost any chance he had to finish out his career with dignity. Joe Garagiola, a mediocre journeyman catcher, testified for baseball in the lawsuit. Years later, Garagiola explained weakly, quote, I thought if the reserve clause went, baseball was going. End quote. In 1973, when the owners agreed to federal arbitration of salary demands, the way was opened for the free agency that now makes players less the pieces of property they once were. Flood was in Spain in 1975 when he learned that the Major League Baseball players had finally won free agency. Two white players, Dave McNally of Montreal and Andy Messersmith of Los Angeles had brought a grievance against the owners, challenging the renewal clause in their basic player contract. The two pitchers won their case when the chairman of the arbitration panel ruled that they could bargain with other teams. During a 1996 interview for a documentary I was writing for HBO, Flood said that he was happy for the victory, but that he felt the decisions had a tinge of racism. Quote, it disappointed me that I didn't win, Flood said, but I had to feel that somewhere in the equation, America was showing its racism again. They were just merely waiting for someone else to win that case. As difficult as it was for even the most palatable African American to get a job in baseball after retirement, Flood's black mark made him untouchable. He was not welcomed back into the game. He played briefly for the Washington Senators in 1971, then, citing personal problems, left the Senators after 13 games. He went to Mallorca, Spain for five years, where he painted and ran a cafe and struggled with alcoholism. He came back to the United States, went to Sweden, then came back home. He returned to baseball briefly when he became a broadcaster for the Oakland A's in 1978. Later, he operated a youth center in Los Angeles. Flood died in January 1997 at the age of 59. Thanks to Kurt Flood, The Last Poets, and Fred Hampton, I emerged from 1969 much more aware, much less naive. Flood put the sports industry in a whole new perspective, the new variation of the slave owner paradigm. He challenged the plantation mentality of big-time athletes, according to which the athlete was supposed to be grateful. Most athletes were and still are operating under that mentality. Happy to be playing, not wanting to rock the boat. In the antebellum South, the slave and the plantation described tangible circumstances. Today, the slave and the plantation describe a state of mind and the conditioning of the mind. In an era of multi-million dollar salaries, 
slavery remains the model for the power relationship between athletes and their owners. A day before Game 4 of the 1999 National Basketball Association's finals between the New York Knicks and the San Antonio Spurs, a throng of media crowded around Larry Johnson, the Knicks' veteran forward. For months, Johnson had refused to speak with reporters. Two weeks earlier, the NBA had fined him $10,000 for not talking to the media after a practice during the Eastern Conference Finals against the Indiana Pacers. He'd been fined another $25,000 during the league finals for again declining the NBA's request to speak to reporters during a Sunday practice session. Johnson not only refused to comply, he cursed the media and a league official for hampering his ability to practice. But now Johnson was ready to give the league what it wanted. The NBA wanted words. LJ would give them words. Quote, I don't care if anybody likes me or not, he began. I play basketball. I play for the New York Knicks. My main focus is to win. You guys, maybe you don't like me or not. Fine, I don't care. Ask my teammates, ask my coach. Y'all can kiss my ass. I don't like you. That has been my motto my whole life growing up. I wear my heart on my sleeve. I make it known I don't like you. That way we don't have to communicate. Those guys out there are the main focus in my mind. Johnson continued referring to his teammates. What we have is a lot of rebellious slaves on this team. Now everyone was all ears. In a nation that equates wealth with happiness, Johnson's equation of well-compensated athletes with largely uncompensated slave ancestors set off a maelstrom of angry criticism. Asked to explain what he meant by rebellious slaves, Johnson snapped. I have to explain that? We don't have a lot of mainstreamers. We don't go along with the masses. We're in a different stream on this team. That year's playoffs culminated a strife-filled season in the NBA that, in its own way, underscored the meaning of Johnson's rebellious slave metaphor. David Stern, the NBA commissioner, acting on behalf of the league's owners, had bullied, beaten, and outmaneuvered the league's 350 players during a nasty three-month-long lockout. The dispute exposed a lack of unity among players and revealed how unprepared the Players Association was to launch a sustained battle against the owners. The lockout revealed the extent to which lavish lifestyles had made many totally dependent on their owners. One poignant example was Kenny Anderson, a guard with the Boston Celtics. Anderson complained that he had a fleet of cars to maintain, mortgages on two homes, and child support payments an admission that did little to win public sympathy for the players' cause. The lockout ended in near complete victory for the owners. This was the backdrop to Johnson's news conference. The reaction to Johnson's comments was swift and unambiguous. Johnson was crucified by the sports media. Sam Smith of the Chicago Sun-Times wrote, quote, Larry Johnson is simply a jerk. Perhaps the worst individual in the NBA. Steve Bopot of the Boston Herald called Johnson outrageous and said he was, quote, like a car accident that you slow to see. Most of the criticism was aimed at Johnson's lack of gratitude. Here he was, a young, wealthy black male who went from poverty in Dallas to making $11 million a season playing professional basketball, talking about slavery. Speaking to a smaller group of media a day after his, quote, rebellious slaves remark, Johnson explained that money had little to do with his analogy of being like a slave on a plantation, but that he was really referring to relationships, namely between owner and worker. Johnson followed his comments with an abysmal game four of the finals. After Johnson's two for eight shooting performance, Bill Walton the former counterculture basketball player at UCLA who had, over his years as a television analyst, 
morphed into a shrill defender of the mainstream, blasted the Knicks' 29-year-old forward. Quote, Larry Johnson, who spent the last 48 hours railing against the world, what a pathetic performance by this sad human being. This is a disgrace to the game of basketball and to the NBA. He played like a disgrace tonight. He deserved it. Johnson fired back. Damn Bill Walton. Tell him to trace his history and see how many slaves his ancestors had. Y'all all trace y'all history and see how many slaves y'all ancestors had. Come on now, that's a touchy subject, but why does the truth always hurt? The criticism of Johnson boiled down to a recurring theme. How could an athlete making millions of dollars per season consider himself a common slave? You can always count on a harsh reaction to any invocation of this unresolved Achilles heel of American democracy, I wrote in my Sports of the Times column. Major intercollegiate sports functions like a plantation. The athletes perform in an economic atmosphere where everyone except them makes money off their labor. In the revenue producing sports of football and baseball, athletes are the gold, the oil, the natural resource that makes the NCAA engine run and its cash register ring. But how can professional black athletes who, as a group, have grown into one of the most identifiable presences in global culture enjoying unprecedented wealth still in the end feel as marginalized and joyless as slaves? Far from being the sad human being that Walton and much of the mainstream press ridiculed him as after his comments, Johnson had up to that point lived a life that fits the sports media's ideal cast for the black athlete. His NBA career represented the classic rags to riches route in professional sports from the ghetto to the gated community. The fact that he came credentialed with his Horatio Alger glow and still showed bitter dissatisfaction, refused to play along, may be one reason the press turned on him with such viciousness. Johnson and Kurt Flood used the same language, speaking not about material poverty but about the ultimate powerlessness of their condition. For Johnson, the plantation was the NBA where power was not shared fairly and players were bought, traded, and discarded when used up. This was, of course, no less true for white players. But Johnson found in his NBA experience surprising parallels with his upbringing in the inner city, which led to his belief that from the plantation to the ghetto to the NBA, the power hierarchy of slavery prevailed. Johnson was born in Dallas, Texas, and was raised on Dixon Circle, a part of South Dallas, he once described as the baddest part of town you'd ever want to see. His mother, Dortha Johnson, was born in Laneview, Texas, and moved to Dallas at age 18. She had a first child, a daughter, when she was 20, and Larry when she was 22. When it became apparent that her son's father would not be around, Dortha vowed to pour everything she had from that point on into raising her children. She worked as a cook at a Dallas country club, often from 10 in the morning to 10 at night. My mom was in the struggle, Johnson would later say. I didn't realize it then, but she was part of the struggle. Johnson, meanwhile, was involved in his share of mischief, from stolen fruit and stolen bikes to fights. He was an active participant, not a spectator, in the rough and tumble fabric of the community. When I was 15, 16, it was all about having fun and trying to survive in my neighborhood. Day to day, I used to run the streets, my mom used to be crying all the time, coming to get me out of the police station all the time. Sports took me off the street. He discovered sports when he was 12, beginning with boxing, and by age 13, he had become immersed in them. At Hood Middle School, Johnson was the starting quarterback on the football team, the center fielder on the baseball team, ran the second leg of the district championship relay team, and was the goalie on the soccer team. Johnson said sports saved him from the streets. His mother told me that the source of his salvation ran deeper than that. Sports doesn't stop anything. Basketball doesn't stop anything, she said. 
The only thing that stops something is when a kid decides this is what I want and stays away from the crime, gets his attitude together and stays away from drugs. As far as I'm concerned, all of those things are in sports. Larry wanted it so bad and he knew he couldn't get it if he was on the street. So it was a combination of his desire and my staying on him. Throughout college and the NBA, Johnson remained connected to Dixon Circle. After his UNLV team won the national championship in 1990, friends took Johnson back to his favorite basketball court. Three or four of the cats I used to play with had gone there after we won the championship and spray painted my name. Big L, number four. Johnson, everywhere. Johnson said, still smiling as he recalled it. It made me feel good to know that a lot of people live through you and a lot of people feel that way about you. But he said that when he goes back to Dixon Circle, he is depressed as well. I go back there and nothing's changed. I'm the only one who got out. Fans in the sports press often deride athletes for not, quote, getting involved. But at the same time, they show extreme wariness when an athlete seems too willing to stay intimate with old friends and neighborhoods in a way that goes beyond league-sanctioned drive-by volunteerism. When players continue to hang out with homies they've had since childhood or find themselves getting caught up in neighborhood drama when by all rights they should be home asleep in the suburbs, the press squeals. Johnson's quote-unquote rebellious slaves comment suggested that he had made a rudimentary start to thinking of his own evolution and commitment to his community in broader terms than merely hanging out there or celebrating his quote-unquote escape. He was asking more fundamental questions about whether, in some ways, he had escaped at all. In Johnson's analysis, Dixon's circle was simply a latter-day plantation an effective blockade of opportunities that reinforced the age-old power equation in America. The police were overseers to keep the residents in their places, the poorly stocked grocery stores, the bad schools, and the easily available drugs and guns kept the poor in their place as much as the old sharecropper system had. Johnson had made a fortune but maintained a focus that saw through his wealth. In a comment that seemed revolutionary, in the mouth of a pampered athlete, Johnson underlined his point. No one man can rise above the condition of the masses of his people. Understand that. So I am privileged and honored by the situation that I'm in. No question. Here's the NBA full of blacks, great opportunities. They made beautiful strides, he said. But what's the sense of that? When I go back to my neighborhood and see the same thing. Everybody else ended up dead in jail on drugs, selling drugs. So I'm supposed to be honored and happy or whatever. But by my success? Yes, I am. But I can't deny the fact of what has happened to us over years and years and years. And we're still at the bottom of the totem pole. You know what I've come to find out in 30 years, Johnson said. For a black man here in America, there is a struggle, and you're either in it or you're not. You can go about your life like it's peaches and cream, and not better the condition of black men and women here, and better our lives and better our community here or not. You're trying to just do well by you. This sense of disconnection from struggle among many athletes is a common motif. Paul Silas, then head coach of the Cleveland Cavaliers and a veteran of 16 NBA seasons as a player, traced its origins to the fact that young African-American athletes are removed from their communities at an early age. I don't envy these kids. They're in a quandary because they don't really fit anywhere. They want to belong. They don't want to change because they want to be like their bros. But they're not. But they don't fit in that other echelon either in white society. They don't want that. So they're just kind of neutral. They don't fit anywhere. It's hard. They've got to be leery of everybody. They have to look at everybody for who they really are and for what they want from you. Like I said, I don't envy any of these kids because they're trying to find where they belong. And really, they don't belong anywhere. Don Cheney. The former New York Knicks head coach said, There's detachment 
when guys are making a ton of money, when you make a lot of money, you walk in a different circle. You're driving better cars, eating in better restaurants. You have a tendency to mingle with the upper class and predominantly the upper class is non-black. This was underlined by NBA star Grant Hill. Asked about the prospect of African-American athletes moving in unison with a sense of righteous indignation, Hill said, When you're making $200,000 every two weeks, it's hard to get angry about much of anything. Asked about Hill's comment, Johnson said, That's what I'm talking about. People saying, I got a good job, that's it. People ask, what happened to the struggle? Niggas got jobs. Johnson said, these people were saying I wasn't appreciative or I didn't appreciate where I came from. Who is it that I should be thankful to? Who is it that I should give thanks to for the blessings that have been bestowed upon me? That's the question. For anyone who bothered to listen, Johnson's rough rhetoric came to a surprisingly pointed conclusion. His point was that in terms of his attitude and desire to maintain a connection to his brothers and sisters back on the plantation, he was essentially a runaway slave. But rather than mixing in, passing or forgetting his roots, he decided to identify himself with the larger community and trumpet the corrupt replication of power relationships from the plantation to the ghetto to the NBA. He saw himself as still being heavily policed and clearly owned. For all the wealth he and his fellow players generated for the league in their Comet quick careers, his share would always be circumscribed through bullying or forcible lockouts if necessary by the dictates of the owners rather than by the widely praised American free market system. All of his success Johnson knew would always be at the pleasure of the white men who signed the checks and the white media who told the stories. And rather than this unfair system provoking any sort of sympathy, it was endorsed by the average fan who was typically already nursing resentment at the quick wealth these athletes attained and sometimes flaunted. Larry Johnson saw his own life in the context of the struggle. But even he seemed to come to his feelings more through intuition than anything else. He never quite articulated what exactly that struggle was or what role he saw for himself in it. He never rooted his angst in the detailed history of his people or even in the history of black athletes in this country. That context might have helped him make more sense of his discontent as it was. It was too easy for others to dismiss it as the ranting of a frustrated player after a loss. Near the end of the 2001 season, the Knicks were playing the Los Angeles Clippers in Los Angeles. During a timeout, a fan who had been heckling the Knicks from behind a bench yelled at Johnson, You're nothing but a $40 million slave! Running down court on his damaged knees, his career hobbling into his final act, Johnson might not have disagreed. The story of the black athlete seemed to go from plantation to plantation, from Tom Molyneux fighting his way to freedom, to pampered millionaires still fighting to own their own labor. Throughout their history, African Americans in sports have broken through one dilemma only to see another emerge. In 2004, the dilemma of ownership seemed at last to be on its way to being solved when a black man became the majority owner of a major American sports franchise. But this seeming triumph only presented a fresh dilemma in the quest for power. End of chapter 10